In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. The psalm says, sing to the Lord a new song. But it doesn't really mean sing to the Lord a new song. It means sing the old song a new way. It changes the entire meaning of the song, depending on how you sing it. Everything changes when you sing it a certain way. Uh, some of you will know who Ray Charles is. He's a blind African-American musician, plays the piano, a number of other instruments, and sings. And you know all of the people who have sung the song America. If you hear him sing it, it arouses things in you that no one who has ever sang that song will bring up. It's just a wonderful rendition. All right? So it should be that the psalms of praise that were given to us from the harp of David and from others, the sons of Koresh and, and, and others, that when we sing them now with the knowledge of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will sound like no one had ever heard these things before. Because the way in which you sing them has to do with what is bursting from you, which is not just the truth of the resurrection, but the implication of the resurrection, that death no longer has any attachment to me whatsoever, or me with it. Because it is said in the Bible, in him was life, and he was a life of men. The life, the life. You know, and, and believing in him brings only life and not death. And so, what do I have to be afraid of? What are the consequences of my physical demise? Nothing. Nothing. There is no consequence. It's like passing from room to room. So I remind you of this in the songs. They didn't create a new vocabulary and a new music. The lyrics remain the same. Some of you watched the marriage of the royals the other day. Some of you watched this. Did any of you pay attention? They sang, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It does not sound one bit like what we say. Not one single bit. It's an entirely different sound. And it has the same words. But because it's sung a different way, it has a different meaning. So they are singing it in the fullness and the expectation that these two are made one in Christ. That William and Kate are now one in Christ. And it's joy. It's overwhelming joy. And it doesn't sound like the way that we sing it. Alleluia, phi pe pi, e ho u, et ta, ep choice, thamiof. It doesn't sound that way. It sounds completely different. So singing a new song, having the old song changed because your heart has changed. This is the meaning of the resurrection. To be able to go along and to be really militant. You thought you were being militant when you said, thok teti gom, Thok teti gom, for thine is the power. Like an army marching, and with this chant, Thok teti gom, Thok teti gom, Thok teti gom, Thok teti gom. But after the resurrection, after the resurrection, it changes. It changes. I told you about, some of you are here, now that weren't here um, for Easter. I told my favorite story about Easter which comes from the Russian church and about the time when the communists had sent their chief propagandist to the Ukraine, to Kiev. 
and after a two-hour lambasting of everything that we hold precious, beating up people left and right intellectually because of their belief in Jesus Christ, the communists sat down and an old priest got up and he said, may I say one thing? And the communist looked at him and said, yes. And he got up and he said, Christos Anisti. And everyone in the entire room jumped to their feet. Everyone in the entire room that had been listening for two hours to what the communist said jumped up as one man and said, Alithos Anisti. So I said, in our church it's going to be that way. So are your knees ready? Is your lower back ready? Is your internal and external maleolus ready? Those are your ankles. Your Achilles tendon. I can go through all the muscles of the thigh. Not to mention the glutes. Christos Anisti. No, not good enough. Down it. Christos Anisti. Okay. When you hear this, I want it to be the thing that, that is coming out of your heart, this swelling power, this certainty of the resurrection of the Savior, that death has been trampled upon and we no longer fear it. The Lord has said, Do not fear him who after he has killed the body has no more than he can do, but fear him who has the power to cast into everlasting darkness. We do not fear the Lord Jesus Christ. He belongs to us and we belong to Him. So when somebody comes up and says something to us, we go, Ha! In this manner, we scoff because we have the power of God because He has deigned to share it with us. Now, as we come back to the Gospel, you know, it's written that the disciples were in a room and for fear of the Jews the door was shut tight and they were huddled and they were afraid because the proof, the proof of the resurrection had not yet come upon them fully. There were nothing but rumors, and the rumors were coming as fast as anything that you've ever heard on television. People were running to the door and whispering through the door all kinds of things that you, you've been found. People are coming to kill you. Jesus has risen, this is, or, 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 or the stone has been pulled back. The, the body is gone, not Jesus has risen. The body has gone. Where, where, where did the body go? They're wondering all these things. And then Jesus appears amongst them and says, Peace be with you. Because this is the peace that gives us the kind of attitude where we can face death without trembling and without qualification and hold our breast open like the man in Upper Egypt when the Muslims were rioting and they said, Unless you deny Christ, you will be shot. And they shot him with a rifle while his arms were extended in this way. And we too, we too do the same thing. I don't remember this man's name. It's on the wall, on the western wall of the church of St. Mina. It's written. The Martyrs of uh, El Kush. I want to tell you to not be afraid of anything. I want to tell you to not become self-absorbed over this, but to be Christ-centered. That means that you understand His power. We read the Cynic Sar, except for this period of time, every time we assemble in the church, except for these days. And it reminds us of the, 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 the terrors people try to inflict upon the saints who carry the name of Christ. And these inflictions of torture, these inflictions of imprisonment, 
all of these things meant nothing to them. And over and over you are reminded of that. So when it comes to your house, your own house, do not have a faint heart. Do not, do not lack, do not lack the ability to do what you know is correct. And what is correct is to have the peace that whatever occurs, occurs because the will of God is with you to be a witness in this manner. Uh, you know, I'd like to be a witness uh, to God in the back seat of a limousine. But it sure may not be my fate. I may have to witness to God on the streets somewhere, bloodied and broken. It may be my fate. It may be that I die peaceably in my bed with my family all around me. It may not be that way. I don't have that, however, as a specter that haunts me. How I die is immaterial because I don't die. I go from this life to the next life and so do you. It's not because I'm a priest. It's because I am a believer. It's because my faith is sealed. It's because no one is going to shake this faith. And, and, and there have been great, great atheists. Great atheists. Who spent all the powerful years of their youth and adulthood repudiating or trying to repudiate everything that was ever said about our Lord. And guess what? More than 50% of them confessed him on their deathbed. Flaming cowards. When they faced the abyss of eternity, they said what Blaise Pascal said in his pensies. These infinite spaces frighten me. Yeah, look up. I remember going to the desert long ago to do a field biology thing in university. And we were mapping out an acre of land in field biology and looking at all of the little ecosystems, the microsystems that, that exist and how they interact, right? And I was out there in my aluminum cot, told it was aluminum because rattlesnakes don't like to climb aluminum. <laughs> and I was in my sleeping bag on my aluminum cot, and uh, rattlesnakes are attracted by heat, so they will come to where any warm body is. They're ectotherms. And uh, I looked up at the stars, and you know, I wear glasses, I wore glasses then. And I, I went like this, and then I went like this, and I went like this. I had never seen so many stars in my whole life. It looked like they were coming down at me. You know, the points of light themselves were, were, were moving down. And I understood what Blaise Pascal said, because most of the time we're in an area where there is heavy air coming from the ocean, and we don't get a good look at we don't get a good look at the heavens. We don't get a good look at uh, the heavens also because of the ambient light that is around. That's why they put observatories like the Keck Observatory. They put that out in Hawaii because there's too much light. But when it is really black and when it is completely without anything, the stars, the stars, it's unbelievable. And he who poised each constellation with all of the star systems, with all of the planets, with all of these things, do you know why he cares about us and cares about our sins? Because we are the only ones who are created in his image and likeness, period, in all of the infinite spaces. We are the only ones who are made like unto our Savior with the imprint of His being. It's like, how do you tell what a golden double eagle is? Because you can recognize it because of the stamp of the coinage. I wish I had a few. But I have another kind of gold. And I know I have this imprint. And I know I have the seal. I know I am orthodox. And I know for a fact 
that all of you do as well. So, this that I am speaking of, that the disciples did not have until the appearance of Jesus Christ, it was only natural that Judas would be envious of and would demand because his feelings were hurt, because didn't the Savior who knows all know that he wouldn't be with them at that time? And the answer is yes. But there had to be one who was unbelieving until Christ was absolutely manifest. And he had to be that one person for the sake of many of us who doubt. And to this day, he's called Doubting Thomas. But people forget the end story where at the death of the Virgin, the Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, St. Mary, when she was being bodily assumed into heaven, the sash around her waist came off and came into the hands of Thomas. And when they rebuked him for not being there when she had called him at the time of her death, when he had not arrived, when she had reposed, they said, you weren't there for Jesus, you weren't there for his mother. He said, I saw her assume into heaven. How could you have seen her assume? And so the eleven then didn't believe the one. The eleven disciples then didn't believe the one. So now there was symmetry and balance. The one had not believed the eleven, and the eleven had not believed the one. Right? And he showed them the sash that she had worn. And when he showed them the sash, they were all silent. So we shouldn't call him Doubting Thomas in this church. We should remember the end story. Because sometimes we have doubt, but that does not take away, that does not take away uh, the things that have happened to you in baptism, in confession, in charismation. Uh, it did not take what happened from all the times you've had communion away from you. You must confess times of weakness again, but it doesn't remove him from you. It's like when you're angry with one of your relatives and you don't want to talk to them. You've been hurt by them and you don't want to see them. But you know, sooner or later, it's inevitable that you're going to have to get back together because you are one family. And there's nothing that you can do about it. So the Lord offered proof of his resurrection to those that were gathered in the house, trembling for fear of the Jews. Then he came again eight days later and showed Thomas. And he said, believe, do not be disbelieving. Take the evidence that you want. It's yours. I give it to you freely. And then finally, finally, for us today, you know, we do not begin or end our existence. We do not have power over our birth, and we do not have power over our death. Now somebody might raise the objection and say, what about suicide? What about suicide, Monica? Somebody might raise the objection, right? That because I said you do not have power over the end of your life, say, what about suicide? That's not the end of your life. That's not the end of your life. Birth, birth, birth is an organic thing. It is a spiritual thing through the baptismal font. Death is a physical thing, but it's not over until the pronouncement of judgment takes place. I bring up a very painful memory for some of you. Uh, Ahmad Gobriel committed suicide. Ahmad Gobriel, the son of the very blessed and very honorable priest Abuna Bashoy Gobriel of St. Mark. Ahmad committed suicide. But Ahmad wasn't of his right mind. Like someone who has a disease. So just because someone 
commit suicide, it does not mean, it does not mean that we who are living beyond his time have the ability to label him as anything because we don't know the inner workings of the heart or the mind at the time the death took place. We do not know. So, man does not have control of his beginning or his end, but he has control of the middle. Your free will, you choose every day to live and die with the Lord Jesus Christ. You live and you work in grace when you remember his holy name and when you witness it. You have to witness it at school. You have to witness it on the job. You have to witness it in your idle time. People have to know that you are Christian and know what you stand for. You do not have to go around and speak it, but if something comes up about God and it is said in error, then this is the opportunity to begin. I don't mean making oneself a pest through proselytization. People hate being lectured at and hate being told that what they believe is inferior to what you believe. But when something comes up, if somebody said in your presence, two plus two are three, you would say, in my mathematics, two plus two are four. And it's demonstrable. I can show you. I have a proof. Well, in apologetics there is a way to show and to prove manifestly that every single thing that you have ever been told is true. And every single thing that those who oppose you is wrong. These books exist and there are some people who read them. And you find somebody who has read the book and you go to him with the problem and that person will show you the way to mount a defense so that where you are, at work, or at school, or in your idle time at home, or going to the supermarket, anywhere you happen to be recreating even, if something comes up, you are prepared to give a defense for those things that the saints have believed since the beginning of this story that we hear from the evangelist St. John, huddled together in fear, ready to stick their chests out to receive any blow after the Lord's peace came upon him. And the peace was the certainty of his resurrection and the certainty of his power over death. Don't ever forget that. Are you ready? Christos Anesti. God bless you all.